Thank you. That concludes topical questions. The next item of business is a statement by Shona Robison on Scottish Budget 2024 to 2025. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of her statement, and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call the Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Finance. Presiding officer, it is a, an enormous privilege to present my first budget, uh, one that is built on our values, setting out in tough times to protect people, sustain public services, support a growing sustainable economy and address the climate and nature emergencies. Our values of equality, opportunity and community are missions that should be at the core of any social democratic government. They are our guiding lights in difficult times, and this is a government committed to equality through tackling poverty and protecting people from harm. At the heart of this budget is our social contract with the people of Scotland, where those with the broadest shoulders are asked to contribute a little more, where everyone can have access to universal services and entitlements, and those in need of an extra helping hand will receive targeted additional support. That is what we mean when, in the face of Westminster austerity, we say that we will always stand up for Scotland. This budget is set in turbulent circumstances. At the global level, the impacts of inflation, the war in Ukraine and the after-effects of the pandemic continue to create instability. In the UK, the combined effects of Brexit and disastrous Westminster policies mean that we are uniquely vulnerable to those international shocks. Recent research by the Resolution Foundation concluded that the UK is now defined by the toxic combination of low growth and high inequality, a stagnation nation. Despite this, our economy has been resilient. Unemployment is low at 3.8% and average earnings in Scotland are growing faster than the UK. Scotland is the top performing economic area outside London and the South East and it's the third largest uh, in terms of wages and gross value added per person in 2021. And of course we have a record number of foreign direct investment projects that were secured in Scotland last year. Devolution has brought many benefits but it has also exposed quite how beholden we are to the decisions of Westminster. We're fighting Westminster austerity with one hand tied behind our back. So in today's budget, the Scottish Government has no say on corporation tax, no powers to mandate the real living wage for all, no ability to consider windfall levies on excess profits and no options on wealth taxes like capital gains tax. Last month's autumn statement was a worst-case scenario for Scotland, a fiscal settlement from the UK Government that undermines the viability of public services across the whole of the UK, including here in Scotland. Our block grant funding for this budget, derived from UK Government spending decisions, has fallen by 1.2% in real terms since 2022-23. Our capital spending power is due to contract by almost 10% in real terms over five years. Under his own fiscal rules, the Chancellor could have invested £27 billion more in core services and critical national infrastructure, but he didn't. Instead, he prioritised tax cuts at the expense of public services. For example, Members of Parliament will receive a £754 tax cut at the expense of funding the NHS and other vital public services. That can't be right, Presiding Officer. And disgracefully, the motivation for this choice is obviously not the national interest, but instead the electoral interest of the Tory party ahead of the coming general election. But be in no doubt, while Scotland remains in this union, we will continue to pay the price of Westminster yeah. austerity. Yeah. Yeah. Given this turbulent economic environment, we are publishing single-year spending plans for 2024-25 in this budget. I recognise the merit of multi-year budgets, but the autumn statement and the OBR's forecasts make future prospects more volatile. I will revisit the multi-year outlook in our 2024 medium-term financial strategy. Presiding officer, I am very grateful to both the Scottish Fiscal Commission and the Office for Budget Responsibility for their engagement in this budget process. I have, of course, used the tax and social security forecast prepared by the Scottish F Fiscal Commission. We've also worked with our Scottish Green Party colleagues to present a budget that is true to our shared priorities. The latest Scottish Fiscal Commission forecasts show a significant improvement in our tax performance, driven by higher earnings growth in Scotland, with Scottish income tax receipts forecast to increase by £1.5 between this year and next. 
This is positive news and has also contributed to Scotland's improved income tax position for 2024-25. On income tax, we will make no changes to the starter uh, basic, intermediate and higher rates of 19%, 20%, 21% and 42%. We will increase the starter and basic rate bans by inflation to 14,876 and 26,561 respectively. I will maintain the higher rate and top rate thresholds at their current levels of 43,662 and 125,140. Maintaining the higher rate threshold in 2024-25 will add an additional £307 million to the income tax forecast as estimated by the Scottish Government. We do not believe that those people who are the backbone of our public service, our teachers, our police officers, our nurses, should see their tax rate increase. Taking the police as an example, constables, sergeants, inspectors and even chief inspectors will not see their tax rate rise. But when public services need investment and protection from Tory cuts, this government does believe that those with the broadest shoulders should pay a higher rate of tax. And to be clear, by the broadest shoulders, I mean the top earning taxpayers. We will therefore add a new income tax band to the Scottish system, the advanced rate, which will be set at 45 pence and will apply on incomes between 75,000 and 125,140. In addition, I will also increase the top rate by 1 pence to 48 pence in 2024-25. The Scottish Fiscal Commission estimate that these policy decisions will raise a further £82 million in revenue next year. We have chosen to create the new band at a threshold above the top of the unpromoted teacher salary scale, above a police chief inspector and above a banned eight-bead nurse. The threshold is set so high it does not even capture MSPs, but in case Mr Ross is wondering, because they get paid more than £86,000, MPs will have to pay a little more tax. Combined, this, the income tax policy I have outlined will grow our much-needed revenues by £389 million. On income tax, only top earners, around 5 per cent of taxpayers, will be impacted by these rate changes. And, of course, no one in Scotland will pay more in council tax for their main home. Overall, taking a different progressive course on income tax in Scotland means that in 2024-25 we estimate that we will have around £1.5 billion of additional revenues compared to if we had followed UK government tax policies. Presiding officer, asking those with more to pay more is the right choice. It is a choice rooted in our values and is in stark contrast to the tax and service cuts of the Tory party. In making these choices, however, we are supporting public services, including those delivered by councils. So let me be clear that this government will fully fund the council tax freeze. This year, in 2023-24, councils set their average council tax increases below the level of inflation. The OBR projection for CPI inflation in the coming year is 3%. Of course, I could fund an inflation-proof 3% council tax freeze, but I want to help support services, so I will go further than that. And that is why I will fund an above-inflation 5% council tax freeze, delivering over £140 million of additional investment for local services. Combined with the other support being provided to local government, this will increase their overall funding by 6% since the last budget, taking local government funding to a new record high of over £14 billion. Helping household budgets during tough times and supporting our local authorities to deliver services. Presiding officer, I can confirm on other devolved taxes that I intend to make no changes to land and buildings transaction tax rates or bans, and that we will introduce legislation to increase the Scottish landfill tax rates in line with planned UK landfill tax increases. On non-domestic rates, I have considered very carefully the steps that I can take that support business, while ensuring that we have the funding necessary to, to protect public services. While the UK Government may be happy to provide tax cuts on the back of real terms cuts to their NHS, I am not. Because let us be clear, if I spent every penny of consequentials on business relief and tax cuts, that would mean a real terms cut to our NHS and other vital public services, just as the UK Government has done. However, I have to also be clear that I will take a balanced approach through this budget. And that includes on how we can support businesses through non-domestic rates. The number one ask we have heard on NDR have been calls to freeze the poundage. 
I am therefore happy to announce that we will freeze the poundage on the basic property rate, protecting businesses with a rateable value up to and including £51,000 from the impact of inflation by freezing the poundage. That is forecast to save ratepayers £37 million compared to an inflationary increase. Alongside inflationary increases in both the intermediate and higher property rates, this will still ensure that Scotland has the lowest rate for all but the largest properties for the sixth year in a row. I am pleased to confirm that in this budget we will maintain the small business bonus scheme, ensuring that 100,000 properties are taken out of rates altogether. For the hospitality sector, we recognise the pressures that they face, and that is why this year we are going to work through the New Deal for Business Group to take forward two actions to be implemented in our budget uh, for next year. First, we will work with the sector to explore uh, long-term targeted solutions and better promotion of existing reliefs, rather than relying on short-term steps that do little for their future sustainability. And second, to examine with the Scottish Assessors the valuation methodology for the hospitality sector to address the concerns that have been raised that it is not truly reflective of the experiences of these businesses. In addition, in recognition of the unique challenges faced by the hospitality sector in our island communities, we will, in this budget, introduce 100% relief for hospitality properties in our islands, capped at £110,000 per business. And we'll take forward the other measures, uh, the two actions that I mentioned earlier in our budget for 2025-26. Presiding officer, we'll prioritise tackling poverty and protecting people from harm. One child or household in po poverty is one too many. This budget prioritises support for low-income households centred around a cash-first approach. So it is here driven by our priorities, by our values, that will make our largest single investment we will invest £6.3 billion in social security benefits and payments, an increase of over £1 billion compared to 2023-24. Supporting disabled people to live full and independent lives, helping older people to heat their homes in winter and aiding low-income families with their living costs, all in all supporting more than one in five people in Scotland. We are supporting those most in need by uprating all Scottish benefits by 6.7% in line with the CPI rate of inflation at September 2023. This includes increasing the weekly amount for our game-changing Scottish Child Payment to £26.70 from April 2024. The Scottish Child Payment lifts children out of poverty and stands as an example for anyone looking to form the next UK Government of the action that can be taken if you are true to your values. Presiding officer, we will continue to deliver free school meals for all children in primary one to five and special schools, and we will invest £43 million in estate upgrades to support the delivery and expansion of free school meals. This includes extending the rollout of free school meals for primary six and primary seven children in receipt of the Scottish Child Payment, providing more children with access to healthy meals uh, during the school day. Presiding officer, due to Westminster mismanagement of our economy, too many households are worrying about debt. With our limited powers, there is only so much we can do. However, where we can step in, we will. That is why I am pleased to confirm that we will provide local authorities with £1.5 million to cancel school meal debt, removing a worry hanging over families up and down the country who are struggling to make ends meet. I can also confirm that through this budget, we will keep the promise to Scotland's care experienced children and young people, providing £50 million through the whole family wellbeing funding for holistic family support. Presiding officer, we recognise the importance of high quality childcare. That is why in 2024 25, we will continue to invest in a more flexible childcare system, which offers families access to more local options, and will expand our innovative childminder recruitment and retention pilots to grow this essential part of the childcare workforce by a thousand more by 2026-27. Affordable housing is a key area for supporting many to find a home, and that's why we will invest over £550 million in the supply programme, helping deliver homes for social rent, mid-market rent and low-cost home ownership in communities across Scotland. Presiding officer, I've said throughout this budget that it's a statement of our values. Unlike some, this government does not think homelessness is a lifestyle choice. We know that those who are homeless need support, not just with housing, but often with other complex challenges that they are facing. 
That is why in 2024-25 we will commit over £90 million in discretionary housing payments and £35 million of additional funding for specific action to end homelessness and reduce the number of households living in temporary accommodation, which is over and above the homelessness funding provided through the local government settlement. It is because we follow our values that we are providing direct support to people tackling poverty and working to achieve a more equal Scotland. Our ability to ensure employment opportunities are available and provide the support required to tackle poverty is reliant on us seizing the huge opportunities that exist in Scotland to build a fair, sustainable and growing economy. Businesses are critical to creating good jobs, delivering fair wages, expanding Scotland's tax base and to help tackle poverty and improve our public services. This budget and the New Deal for Business support our national strategy for economic transformation. Only yesterday, the Fraser of Allender Institute published a study showing that the renewable energy sector supported more than 42,000 jobs across the Scottish economy and generated over £10.1 billion of output in 2021. This is yet another illustration of the significant opportunity to develop the renewables supply chain and maximise the economic benefits from Scotland's renewables potential. That is why we will invest nearly £67 million to kickstart our commitment of up to £500 million over five years to leverage private investment in the infrastructure and manufacturing facilities critical to the growth of the offshore wind sector. Delivering the critical infrastructure for a green and growing economy requires investment, and that is why we are boosting funding for digital connectivity from £93 million to £140 million in this budget. Recognising the importance of planning to a growing economy, we will work with local authorities, business organisations and the development sector, setting out options to accelerate the planning system in a consultation paper published in early 2024. And to tackle structural barriers to employment, we will invest up to £90 million in devolved employability services in 2024-25, providing support to people who are keen to re-enter the workforce but need help when taking the final steps. Recognising the needs of the Highland economy, we will progress the next phase of the A9 duelling programme in 2024-25, including commencing construction on the Tomatin Tomoy section and advancing procurement and land acquisition for further sections. The Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Net Zero and Just Transition will be making a statement on the detail to Parliament tomorrow. Presiding Officer, our Aim for opportunity is about more than economic opportunity. It's also the, the opportunity for individuals and organisations to realise their potential. And that's especially true of our nation's culture. The transformational power of our culture is immense, attracting people from all over the world who want to come here and experience it firsthand. As the first instalment of delivering the First Minister's commitment to double arts and culture funding, we will increase funding for culture in 2024-25 by £15.8 million, restoring funding to Creative Scotland for utilising their reserves this year and more. This is only the first step on the route to investing at least £100 million more in the arts and culture by 2028-29, and our aim to increase arts and culture investment in 2025-26 by at least a further £25 million. Presiding officer, perhaps the biggest opportunity before us and one of the most pressing dangers the world faces is in the climate emergency and our actions to address it. While the UK government rolls back, we will take action. We will invest nearly £2.5 billion on public transport to support our bus, rail and ferry networks, ensuring there is a viable alternative to car use for those who need it and to allow people to make sustainable choices. This includes investing more than £425 million in bus services through our network support grant and our concessionary travel schemes for under 2022s and older and disabled people. Our investment in public transport also includes £434 million to support our island communities through the provision of ferry, port and harbour services. ScotRail and the Caledonian Sleeper are now in public hands and through this budget we are providing £1.6 billion for rail to support passenger rail services as well as the operation, maintenance and renewal of our rail infrastructure. We will invest £220 million in active travel as we continue increasing our investment in walking, wheeling and cycling. 
We also need to have a step change in how we heat our homes. So we're providing £358 million to continue to accelerate energy efficiency upgrades and installation of clean heating systems. Investing £49 million to make progress in Scotland's transition to a circular economy. Effective support for nature can bring a substantial impact in sequestering uh, carbon. That's why we're investing £129 million to maintain and restore peatlands and increase woodland creation. We recognise the vital role that agriculture plays in the rural economy and the opportunity to become more productive and sustainable. And I can confirm that we will provide the same level of support through direct payments to farmers and crofters that was available pre-Brexit. We are currently providing farmers and crofters with the most generous package of support anywhere in the UK. We will also provide additional funding to support them to transition to a new support framework. In November, I wrote to the NFU Scotland President to reiterate my commitment that the funds that had been released to support the cost of living crisis would be returned in full to be spent on the right agricultural priorities at the appropriate time. Agricultural Scotland has taken the hit for a Brexit we did not vote for. This budget demonstrates the Scottish Government is resolute in our support for our farmers and crofters right across Scotland. Presiding officer, while the UK Government have chosen to prioritise tax cuts at the expense of the NHS and public services, our values and therefore our choices are very different. We recognise that we cannot address the financial challenges before us through tax alone or by delivering public services in traditional ways. Our approach must be investment and reform. Working in partnership with Scotland's trade unions, we will take action to ensure our services remain sustainable, improve outcomes and support the people and communities who need them most. This approach will be underpinned by our continued commitment to our policy of no compulsory redundancies. Reform takes time and so we are also taking decisive steps today. Presiding officer, investing in Scotland's NHS is a non-negotiable for this government. Health consequentials from the autumn statement from the UK Government to Scotland amount to a total of £10.8 million. That's equivalent to five hours of NHS Scotland activity. It's evident from this, the autumn statement that the UK Government has no intention of funding pay up lists for staff in England. Instead, as many independent analysts have said, we're looking at deep real terms cuts to public services across Scotland. We choose to take different choices in Scotland. And that's why we're delivering an increase of over £550 million to NHS frontline boards, a 4.3% uplift, taking their total investment to over £13.2 billion. That's above real terms protection for the NHS in Scotland in the face of UK government austerity and a real terms cut to the NHS in England. This investment will help the NHS continue to evolve its delivery of services and work to improve waiting times. New services and innovations will need a step change in our reform programme, and that's why we'll take forward a national conversation to help shape the NHS for the future. In stark contrast to others who, in their words, are keeping the door wide open for the private sector in our NHS, we remain absolutely committed to keeping our NHS publicly owned publicly operated and free at the point of need. We know that one of the keys to a successful NHS is the su successful provision of social care so that everyone has access to consistently high quality care whenever they need it. We are investing £2 billion in health and social care integration, meaning that we are already exceeding our commitment to increase social care investment by 25% by the end of this parliament two years early. We're supporting hardworking social care and early learning and childcare workers in the private, third and independent sectors by providing over £200 million of additional funding to raise pay to at least £12 an hour from April 2024. That's the equivalent of a rise of £2,000 for full-time workers a year, a pay rise of over 10% in a year. We recognise that disabled people living in Scotland face particularly difficult barriers and that's why we are reopening the Independent Living Fund. This will enable up to 1,000 disabled people in Scotland to access the support they need and deserve to live independent lives. 
One of our key partners in the delivery of services is, of course, local government. And through our partnership with local government under the Verity House Agreement, we will work with COSLA to empower councils through a new fiscal framework, which also increases discretion to determine and set fees and charges locally. Through the fiscal framework, we will also seek to ensure that distribution arrangements continue to meet the needs of our remotest communities and changing population. One of the key services that councils deliver, of course, is schools. And delivering excellence and equity in Scottish education remains a top priority for the Scottish Government. This requires meaningful engagement with students, teachers, families, support staff and communities that rely on our education system. We remain committed to investing £1 billion over the course of this Parliament to tackle the poverty-related attainment gap. This long-term targeted investment improves outcomes for our children and young people and helps break the cycle of poverty with recent statistics showing record levels of literacy and numeracy attainment at primary school level and improvements in secondary. As part of this, £130 million of pupil equity funding will continue to empower headteachers across Scotland to invest in the best approaches to improving literacy, numeracy and health and wellbeing of the children and young people in their schools. We will continue to provide £145.5 million to councils to maintain teachers in the system and enable councils to offer permanent contracts to our education workforce. And we're taking action to support our colleges, universities and skills system with over £2.4 billion of investment, including protecting free tuition and driving forward our commitment to widening access. Presiding officers, safety and security of the public is one of the most important duties of any government. And that's why we will invest £1.55 billion in policing in 2024-25, increasing the Scottish Police Authority resource budget by 5.6 per cent, an additional £75.7 million, a real terms increase for Police Scotland, providing the resources needed to support frontline service delivery. We're also increasing the police core capital funding by 12.4 per cent to £64.5 million for investment in the police estate technology and fleet. Another key blue light service is of course the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. We have listened to and engaged with SFRS. That is why next year we will provide them with a resource uplift of £13.5 million and increased capital investment of £10.3 million, enabling the service to improve its facilities. For the Scottish Prison Service, we are committing an additional £38.6 million to their resource budget an additional 10 per cent to meet their rising costs. We will also invest in the modernisation of the prison estate, providing £167 million in capital funding, progressing much needed replacements for HMP Inverness and HMP Barlini. Presiding officer, I know there will be members who want us to go further in different areas in this budget. I would remind them that we are in a situation because of the constraints placed upon us by a UK government that does not share our values, our principles or our commitment to public services. Thank you, members. Quite simply, we cannot spend money that we do not have and we can't mitigate every cut made by the UK government. We are at the upper limit of the mitigation that can be provided within the devolved settlement. We will always do our best with the powers that we have, but there is simply no substitute for independence. We have always said that to truly transform our economy, society, Thank you, members. We've always said that to truly transform our economy, society and public services and to reap the benefits of Scotland's resources for current and future generations, we need the full powers of independence and to retake our place in the European Union. The autumn statement and its impact on services was just the latest example of why Scotland must walk a different path. Through the choices we have made in this budget, we have been true to our values and rigorous in prioritising our investment where it will have most impact. Our social contract with the people of Scotland is at the core of this budget and shines through every funding decision contained within it. We choose investment in our people and our public services. This is a budget that reflects our shared values as a nation and speaks to the kind of Scotland that we want to be. Presiding officer, I am proud to commend it to Parliament. Thank you. Thank you.
The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised. In her statement, I intend to allow around 60 minutes for questions, after which we will move on to the next item of business. I would be grateful if members who wish to put a question were to press their request to speak buttons. And I call on Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, and uh, I'm sure it's very good to see the presiding officer uh, back in the chair. What is not so good is the extraordinary late delivery that we received of what is an important budget statement, which I consider to be a discourtesy to Parliament. Now, in her very lengthy letter to the Chancellor on the 20th of November, the Deputy First Minister set out all her demands for the Scottish economy. Shona Robson wanted more money from the UK Government for public services, for increased capital investment for infrastructure, and more money for public sector pay increases. And she said, and I quote, businesses across Scotland have faced various challenges in recent years, so I encourage you to take action by using the reserved tax levers at your disposal to support them. Now, I have read that letter several times, and I can't see any acknowledgement anywhere, none whatsoever, that the Scottish Government takes any responsibility for the current fiscal circumstances in Scotland. Yeah, 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 yeah. Indeed, there was a complete abrogation of responsibility for the running of the Scottish economy, yeah. not just for this financial year, but for the last 16 years. And, presiding <laughs> officer, that is not only disingenuous, but it will not wash with the public, because the current... Because the current fiscal situation in Scotland reflects the policy decisions that have been made right here in Holyrood by the SNP all the time that they have been in government. And pandering to the Greens as well, most of the time, ministers have failed to improve public services. They have failed to undertake the public sector reform, which economists and analysts have been warning about for years. And they have failed miserably to grow the economy thereby starving Scotland of much-needed revenue required to close the gap on the huge bills for public expenditure. Indeed, if the Scottish economy had grown at the same rate as the UK economy over the same time that the SNP had been in power, we'd have had a lot of extra billions to spend, yeah. just as we would have done if we hadn't had billions of taxpayers' money wasted on failed projects. Yeah. So of course, so of course, the Scottish Ms. government. Miss Smith, Miss Smith, Miss Smith, if you might give me a moment, I must ask that we don't have shouting from the front bench. Members, let's hear one another in this important session, Miss Smith. I think the first minister is embarrassed by that because the first minister knows full well that the UK Government is having to help Scotland to be insured. And to ask the UK Government to use its tax levers to support business really does take the biscuit. Last year and this year, the UK Government decided, on top of all the furlough and the cost of living support in the pandemic, to give businesses 75% rates relief. But oh no! The Scottish Government refused to pass on these Barna consequentials, with, with the exception, I think, this year for the islands. So my first question, Cabinet Secretary, even in line with your own demands to the Chancellor, why are you not supporting business more? Yep. And that's in line, I may say, with some of the comments from your backbenchers too. Yep. Secondly, and again with your backbenchers in mind, do you really think that by increasing the tax burden, and also the income tax differential between Scotland and the UK, that you are sending out the right message that Scotland is open for business, for economic growth, for investment, for innovation and for job creation, because it's abundantly clear that business and industry doesn't think so, Sir Tom Hunter included. And with regard to local government, which seems to be getting only a half of what they asked for, perhaps even less of a half of what they uh, we're asking for. Does the Cabinet Secretary not accept that the long-term cuts which the SNP has imposed on core local government funding over many years could have been reversed for the next financial years if it cancelled its controversial National Care Service Bill with all its spiralling costs 
that, and gave that money to frontline services, yeah. which are more in line with the priorities of the people of Scotland. Well Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> Can I uh, also uh, join Liz Smith in, in welcoming the presiding officer back to her seat? Uh, can I also say um, my apologies for the late uh, statement? Um, more money for uh, the, 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 the public uh, sector and more money for capital. I think we're, we're quite uh, modest ass of this UK government. The UK uh, Tory Chancellor had £27 billion of fiscal headroom, but chose to deliver only tax cuts and no investment in public services. That is a political choice made by the Tory Chancellor, but not one that will be taken by this SNP government. The £1.5 billion, of course, that we have uh, in addition to spend due to the tax decisions that we've taken here are the actions taken yeah. by this SNP government. And Liz Smith mentioning failed projects, I have to say to her, with the growing list of HS2, yeah. a failed Rwanda yeah. policy yeah. and the latest yeah. PPE yeah. scandal, I don't think that's something she should really bring uh, to this chamber. In terms of the, num the top three asks for business, of course, there are three concerns. The top three concerns are inflation, interest rates and energy costs, compounded by the decisions made by this UK government. Yeah. In terms of the uh, issues of, of tax, I have been very, very clear that uh, the tax position uh, is uh, going to only impact on the highest earning 5% of taxpayers in 2024-25. Uh, and if you look at those earning um, around 28,850, um, that's 51% of Scottish taxpayers. They'll continue to pay less income tax in 2024-25 and than if they lived elsewhere uh, in the UK. And in terms of growing the economy, uh, we have been very clear. I set out in my, uh, my statement the actions that we were taking uh, to grow the economy. And of course, since 2007, GDP per capita in Scotland has grown 10% compared to 6.4% at the UK oh. level. Average oh. earnings in Scotland are now growing faster than in the UK. And next year, we'll continue supporting investment that seizes the opportunities of our net zero transition and work with business and investors to launch a new green industrial strategy. So we'll get on with delivering what is a balanced budget, a budget that recognises the needs of public services first and foremost, but also households and the needs of business presiding officers. Michael Mara. Thank you, presiding officer. This is a chaotic budget from an incompetent government that will leave ordinary Scots paying much more and getting much less in return. The SNP's mismanagement of our public finances has left us with a massive gap to be filled between what they promised and the tax revenues the ordinary Scots pay. That's an SNP waste gap, it's an SNP incompetence gap, and it's a huge SNP growth gap. If Scotland's economy had kept pace with other parts of the UK, it would now be eight and a half billion pounds larger. And the failure of this government over 16 years to focus on the priorities of country rather than party means they now need the taxpayers to bail them out as a result. And, presiding officer, it is chaos. There's no other word for it. They were raising council tax by 22 per cent and suddenly, unbeknownst to civil service or even to the cabinet, they were freezing it. They had a plan to cut thousands of jobs, thousands of jobs in the public sector. Then the Deputy First Minister came to Parliament and said the plan was cancelled. Now the plan for thousands of job cuts is back with a vengeance. The Deputy First Minister invited all opposition parties to suggest their cuts. And then Hamza Youssef announced a billion pounds of conference spending commitments as he panic spent public money following the Rutherglen by-election. And now we're told the black hole is the biggest it's ever been. They have neglected the day job of growing the economy and delivering public services for Scotland. Tax cannot and should not be used as a substitute for economic growth. Because NHS waiting times are soaring. Cancer waits up again this very day. 
GP services and NHS dentistry, a fiction, presiding officer, for many across our country. But it does not need to be like this. Scotland cannot accept more managed decline from the SNP with two incompetent governments across the UK. Scotland needs change, and presiding officer, change is coming. So, presiding officer, does she, the Deputy First Minister, accept that her government's failure to grow Scotland's economy means we are lagging behind England and Wales? Will this horrendous budget mean? What will it mean for the one in seven Scots currently on an NHS waiting list? How many more Scots will be on NHS waiting lists by next year? How many public sector workers will be made redundant as a result of this budget? And why does she think the hard-pressed people of Scotland should bear the brunt of her government's failures in higher taxes and cuts to services? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I am not sure in there whether Michael Maher is saying that he is against yeah. those with the broadest shoulders paying yeah. a bit more yeah. and therefore yeah. there would be less revenue there would be less revenues for public services so I, I take it what Michael Mara is confirming today is that the Labour Party would see £82 million less yes. investment uh, yeah. in public yeah. services yeah. so that is now on the record and I think that is something that is incredible for a Labour finance uh, spokesperson today the Welsh uh, Labour government, of course, set their budget. And this is what the Welsh Finance Minister, Rebecca yeah. Evans, had to say. She said, we've had to take some really difficult decisions mm. to radically redesign our spending plans, to focus funding on the services which matter most uh, to the people of Wales. We've been presented with the most stark and painful budget choices in the devolution era. Yep. And we've had to reshape departmental spending plans so that we can invest more in our schools and protect the NHS. Those are exactly the same issues yep. facing this government. So why is it that Michael Mara and the Labour Party in this place support the position of the Welsh Labour government in putting the blame where it lies at the UK government's door, but they come here and don't accept the same premise for this Scottish Thank you. government? Let me be really clear. In my statement, I've been clear that we are prioritising funding for the <laughs> NHS and vital frontline services. And that we are raising revenues in order to do that. And in terms of jobs in the public sector, as Michael Mara knows, we have a position very clearly of no compulsory redundancies. So we will work with our trade union colleagues in making sure that we reform our services in a way that can make them sustainable and high quality. That's what we'll get on. We'll just leave Michael Mara and the Labour Party to whinge from the sidelines as they always do. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and welcome back. Um, the SNP has spent years ignoring expert warnings about the lack of a long-term economic strategy, about the impact of its failure, its failure to grow the economy. And Scotland needs predictability and a long-term plan for both tax and the wider economy, not erratic changes that will undermine confidence. We now know from this budget who is going to pay the price. Everyone who is currently going without social care that they need. Parents who can't access childcare. Pupils left behind as Scotland slides down the international rankings. Presiding officer, councils are on the brink and education is half of what they do. The vulnerable, pupils, taxpayers, all taxpayers, all suffering the cost of SNP green incompetence from ferries to the white elephant takeover of social care. This is about priority. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, why is her government slashing energy efficiency in the middle of a climate emergency? And why is she slashing the housing budget in the middle of a housing emergency? Cabinet Secretary. Well, in the face of a 10% cut to our capital budget from the UK government over the next five years, we are taking the action we need to prioritise the investment in our vital infrastructure. Can I say to Alex Cole Hamilton, there's nothing erratic about making sure that our tax decisions raise £1.5 billion of additional revenues that would not be there had we followed the UK government tax policy. And we are, as I set out in my statement, very clear about investment in the front line. Let me talk, you mentioned local government. 
The total resource budget uh, has increased by £840.3 million since the 23-24 uh, budget. That's 6.8 per cent cash and 5 per cent a real terms increase. On top of the growth, the budget also makes available up to £144 million to support councils to freeze their council tax. So in total, the budget makes over £14 billion of funding available to councils should they agree to freeze the, the council tax. That is a record level of funding yep. to local government, over £14 billion. Alex Cole Hamilton should have maybe looked at the figures before he came to this chamber. <laughs> Thank you. I would advise members that obviously there is a considerable uh, interest in uh, asking questions and therefore we will need to have shorter questions and shorter answers. And I call Kenneth Gibson to be followed by <coughs> Roger Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Deputy First Minister has had to make very difficult choices, not least because of decisions made by the Chancellor in his autumn statement, such as freezing capital expenditure at a time of high inflation. What will be the impact of such a freeze on public investment in Scotland's infrastructure, productivity, economic growth and labour market participation? And does she agree that widening the tax base, nurturing new business start-ups and backing innovation would boost the economy and help deliver the resources needed to fund our public services? Cabinet Secretary. So, um, as I said earlier, uh, our capital spending uh, power has reduced because the UK government has persistently underinvested in infrastructure and have not inflation proofed their capital budget. So, it now will take longer to deliver on all of our planned capital projects and programmes unless the UK government changes course and increases its investment in its capital programme. Despite these cuts, though, we are using all of our powers to maximise the funding available to support employment and indeed to support the economy, achieve net zero and maintain high quality public services and infrastructure. Murdo Fraser to be followed by Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Ahead of this budget, the business community in Scotland had two key asks. Firstly, that the income tax differential with the rest of the UK should not be widened. And secondly, that the Chancellor 75% of rates relief for retail, hospitality and leisure businesses delivered in England for the second year yep. would be replicated here. In both cases, the Finance Secretary has, has decided to do the opposite of what they ask. Doesn't this just leave the much vaunted New Deal for Business in tatters and leave the position of the Economy Secretary in this Cabinet utterly untenable? Cabinet Secretary. Let's be clear, Murdo Fraser has just put on the record that the Tories wanted us to follow the UK Government Tory spending plans, which would have meant that out of the £320 million available and consequentials for this year, £260 million of that would have gone on tax cuts for business, not the NHS. That would have meant only £10.8 million of investment in our NHS. Cabinet Secretary, please resume. We will not have this shouting across front benches, and that is both of the front benches I'm currently looking at. Cabinet Secretary, please resume. That would have meant us replicating the real terms cut to NHS yeah. England here in Scotland. Let me tell Murdo Fraser what that would have meant to health boards. A 0.8% real terms reduction applied to health boards in Scotland would have resulted in over half a billion pounds less funding <laughs> for our health boards this year. Let me tell you what that would have meant for Murdo Fraser's health board. So in Fife, that would have been 31.27 million less. In Tayside, 35.27 million less funding. I hope he's going to explain that to his constituents when he goes back to meet them, because I think they'll be very interested in Murdo Fraser's priorities. Yeah. Business tax cuts over NHS funding. That's not the priorities of this Absolutely. SNP government. Pam Duncan Glancy to be followed by John Mason. Thanks. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. This budget boasts on one hand about investing in colleges, universities and skills, and on the other hand cuts a million pounds from the Scottish Funding Council who pay colleges and universities to deliver those skills. Warm words that they want people to, to get opportunities through further and higher education are cold comfort when they face a devastating cut like this, on top of a year when they faced cuts and had money snatched away. Colleges and universities are doing an incredible job in considerably hard and harder times, but they're doing this against a backdrop of higher costs and year-on-year -year cuts. So today's news will leave them wondering whether this government really values them 
at all. And rather than recognising their value, the Would government question, has again please? set them back. So can I ask the Deputy First Minister, where does she expect these Scottish Funding Council cuts to fall? And if it will be on colleges and universities, how much funding will college cut be, colleges be cut? And how much will universities be cut? And how does she plan to explain this to colleges, universities and students? Well, can I say to Pam Duncan Glancy that the Education and Skills Resource Budget has increased by £144 million, or 4.8%. But you know, Pam Duncan Glancy and anyone else on the Labour benches cannot come here demanding more money for education when the finance spokesperson for your party has basically just said they want £82 million less to be spent on public services yeah. because they don't agree with the new advanced tax yeah. rate. So you That's cannot exactly come asking for more money for when you've response. actually said you want less money for public services. That absolutely does not add up. And I hope that we're not going to hear more funding calls from the rest of the Labour benches because that would be totally incompetent from the Labour Party. I call John Mason to be followed by Miles Briggs. John Mason. The, the Deputy First Minister mentioned that she was targeting some support, for example, in the hospitality sector. Can she explain her thinking between how she targets support and give, as against universal benefits? Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> Well, clearly uh, we have to balance out those uh, universal uh, benefits and targeted benefits, and that is something that we will do. We are looking at programmes uh, across the government, and we've been looking uh, at ways that we can make sure that we have the right balance of universal services for as many people as possible, but where necessary that we target our resources, like, for example, on uh, the Scottish uh, child payment. So we will set out over the coming months where that balance lies, but it does mean that we will have uh, difficult decisions uh, to make. And that's why, of course, in our free school meals expansion, we are targeting uh, through uh, those that are in receipt of the Scottish Child Payment, prioritising uh, that provision in a way that makes sure that children and young people who need it most are the priority. I call Miles Briggs to be followed by Michelle Thompson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. In recent months, both Edinburgh and Glasgow City Councils have declared housing emergencies. Under this SNP Green Government, we see a record number of homeless people in Scotland and children living in temporary ac accommodation. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister if she could explain to Parliament, therefore, why cutting our housing budget by over a third will help address this situation? Cabinet Secretary. Can I say to Miles Briggs, the UK government cut the housing yeah, budget. Your right. own government cut the housing budget. And I find it astonishing, Deputy President Officer, that we have members of the Tory party coming here demanding we spend more money on areas that their government have cut, which means that we don't get any consequentials for housing or homelessness in our budget. And if we follow what we've just heard from the front bench, we'd be putting every single penny of that into business tax cuts. So you can't come here demanding more money to be spent on housing or homelessness when you want every penny to go on business tax cuts. You really need to get yourself more joined up because you're looking pretty incompetent from where I'm standing. I call Michelle Thompson to be followed by Neil Baby. Miss Thompson. The, Gre the Grangemouth Flood Pre Prevention Scheme in my constituency of Falkirk East is a vitally important infrastructure project. The project has been waiting for some time for clarity over funding for the next stages. Now, I have assumed the delay has been due to budget uncertainty, particularly around capital. So is the Cabinet Secretary, as a result of this budget, able to shed any light on funding for flood event schemes generally and Grangemouth specifically? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, can I thank Michelle Thompson uh, for her question? She will be aware, of course, that we have made uh, available £42 million uh, per year to local authorities to invest in important flood uh, risk management actions. And we've committed uh, an additional £150 million over the course of this Parliament to support these actions. The Grangemouth Flood Prevention Scheme is exceptional in terms of scale and financial costs and as such it requires careful consideration uh, and the Scottish Government will continue to work with Falkirk Council to ensure that the scheme brought forward delivers for the local community and the economy and I'll make sure the Minister uh, sets up a meeting with Michelle Thompson to discuss the details. 
I call Neil Bibby to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. I may be cr uh, corrected if I'm wrong, but I'm a bit concerned that I didn't hear the Deputy First Minister actually mention the term economic growth in her statement. The Deputy First Minister has announced a £15.8 million increase in cash terms for the arts and culture budget, yet the Creative Scotland budget line is less than it was in 2022-23. That only leaves £4.7 million in cash terms for the rest of the sector and promises of jam tomorrow. Does the Deputy First Minister accept the budget announcement does not rise to the challenge of dealing with the crisis in the sector affecting jobs, venues and organisations, and the Government are not on track to deliver their own promise of £100 million, the Government's own promise of £100 million over the next five years? Cabinet Secretary. Well, firstly, uh, I mentioned economic growth on a number of occasions and made very clear the actions that we were taking. Secondly, I announced clearly the additional funding for culture uh, in my statement. That is something that we will deliver on as per the First Minister's uh, commitment. But yet again, we have a Labour member coming here demanding more money when their front bench yeah. have said they yeah. want the less budget. money you because they don't support yeah. the tax changes yeah. that we're making you in this budget. So I can't Labour understand Labour where Neil Bibby Labour thinks Labour this Labour money Labour is Labour going to come Labour from Labour when they're against Labour the additional Labour revenues Labour that we will raise through the decisions that we are taking. I call uh, Stuart McMillan to be followed by Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the additional resources for Police Scotland and also the additional resources for the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. Two of the items that I spoke to the Deputy First Minister about last week when we met, the third being the Inverclyde Social Economic Task Force. Can the Deputy First Minister provide more detail regarding the funding allocation for both Police Scotland and also the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, which I hope will result in extra resources being channelled directly to these emergency services in my Greenock and Inverclyde constituency? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the investment uh, in the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service has been um, in response to some of the concerns that have been raised by Stuart McMillan and others. And of course, uh, I met with the Justice Secretary to make sure that what is in this budget will help deliver some of the infrastructure needs of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. It is obviously an operational matter in terms of how that money is spent, but I'm sure the Justice Secretary would be happy to meet with Stuart McMillan in terms of the details of that funding allocation going forward. I call Ross Creer to be followed by Jackie Dunbar. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Deputy First Minister has confirmed the positive impact of the decisions made in response to green proposals on tax since 2017-18, with £1.5 billion now available to support public services as a result. That's in sharp contrast to a UK Tory government which prioritises tax cuts for their rich mates and a Labour Party actively opposed to redistributing wealth from the richest to those most in need. So can I ask the Deputy First Minister what that additional £1.5 billion from green tax policies will deliver for public services in Scotland next year. Cabinet Secretary. That doesn't change. Uh, can I say to Ross uh, Greer that the Scottish Fiscal Commission have estimated that our income tax policy choices since devolution will raise around an additional £1.5 billion in 2024-25 compared to if we had matched UK government policy. And that's vital revenue to invest in our public services and presumably we would have 1.5 billion less to spend had we followed the advice of the Tories here uh, on the left and indeed it seems that the Labour Party are in exactly the same place wanting less money for our public services those are not the priorities of this government. I call Jackie Dunbar to be followed by Pam Gozo. Thank you presiding officer. Can the Deputy First Minister provide any further information regarding how the Scottish budget will help to reduce the cost of the school day for uh, low-income families. Cabinet Secretary. Well, reducing the cost of the school day uh, is really important, and that's why the decision has been made around the school meal debt as a, as a straightforward, practical way this government can support uh, households who are struggling with debt, and that's something we will take forward uh, with COSLA and local government to make sure we deliver it. I call Pam Gozo to be followed by Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what impact analysis has been undertaken on her decision to raise income taxes and whether this includes an analysis on the impact of behavioural changes in Scotland's labour market? Cabinet Secretary. Well, behavioural change, of course, is always part of the Scottish Fiscal Commission's uh, analysis, uh, which is why they have um, said that there's £82 million will be raised by the advanced uh, tax 
banned, which of course, as I said in my statement, only impacts on 5% uh, of taxpayers and that a majority of taxpayers in Scotland uh, will still pay less tax than they would if they lived uh, elsewhere uh, in these islands. So the behavioural analysis is something we will of course keep a very close eye on, but it is something that is at the heart of the Scottish Fiscal Commission's analysis. I call Audrey Nicholl to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Thank you. As well as households, businesses across Scotland are facing substantial pressures as, as a result of rising costs. So can the Deputy First Minister provide any update about the Scottish Government's latest engagement with businesses and business groups to ensure that their views and concerns have been taken into consideration in this budget? And can she say any more about how the budget will support businesses in Scotland to thrive as we move forward in our economic recovery and transformation? Cabinet Secretary. So I know that uh, Neil Gray, uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Wellbeing and Economy, met with business earlier today. And of course, we know that the key asks and key concerns of business are around inflation, around interest rates, around energy costs. And their number one ask has always been around the freezing of the poundage. And I'm very pleased that for the sixth year in a row, we've been able to freeze the poundage and make sure it is lower than elsewhere in these islands. And I'm sure that that is something that the business will uh, will welcome. I also uh, met um, recently with uh, the CBI whose main ask was around simplifying the planning process and that's why in my statement I made reference to us taking forward work uh, on the planning process to see how we can make sure, particularly for those big projects, that we have uh, the capacity within our planning system and the expertise needed to make sure we move projects forward at pace. I call Daniel Johnson to be followed by Clay Hockey. At a time when renters and homeowners are facing spiralling costs, this budget cuts more than £200 million from the housing budget. That means in two years, spending on new housing will have halved. While we face skill shortages, colleges and universities face a cut of £100 million. And while we need to be supporting businesses, our enterprise agencies are being cut by £63 million, 25% in two years. Housing, skills, enterprise support, all levers that are vital for growth and all being cut in this budget. So is it the case that the Scottish Government has given up on growth altogether? Cabinet Secretary. No, but it's in recognition that we've got a 10% cut to our capital budget over the next five years. And if the Welsh Labour Finance Secretary was standing here, she, of course, would be making the point that that is due to the UK Government decisions to cut our capital budget by 10% over five years. It's just a pity that the Labour Party in here cannot put the responsibility where it lies, and that is at the door of the UK Government. In terms of our investment in housing and skills and enterprise, I set out in my statement the priority that we are giving to those areas. But I cannot stand here and say that the, the budget decisions of the UK government on an austerity budget is going to have no impact on our budget. And if the Labour Party want to tell me where they would take money from elsewhere in this budget to apply to the areas that Daniel Johnson wants to apply to, then I'm able and willing to listen to this. But if you just want to come here and ask for no more money, to ask for more money on the basis of having no more money and opposing tax rises from the front bench, then you have no credibility yeah. whatsoever. And don't tell I call um, Claire Hoppy to be followed by I have Brian to say to Daniel Johnson. His um, patronising manner I, I, in this chamber Cabinet leaves Secretary, a lot to be desired. Cabinet Secretary, very please disrespectful. resume your seat a second. I thought you had finished. I would say to the benches over here, who are normally better behaved, that we do have to have the courtesy of listening to the person who's been asked to respond. And that wasn't, I have to say, very courteous. So, could we now move on, please, to Claire Hockey, to be followed by Brian Whittle. Thank you, President Officer, and I refer members to my entry in the Register of Interest in that I hold a bank staff nurse contract with NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Investment in our NHS over the years from this Scottish Government has led to record high staffing levels and ensured we have the best performing core A&E services across the UK. Can the Deputy First Minister outline how this newly announced record NHS funding will be used to improve A&E weights and reduce waiting lists? 
Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I say to Claire Hockey, um, this goes to the heart of the priorities that we've set here. There wasn't funding to do everything that we would have wanted to do. So we've had to prioritise. We also had to make the decision, of course, that we wouldn't just pass on a real terms cut in health funding of £10.8 million. So in order to make sure that we could give the NHS that real terms increase, we had to prioritise funding to our NHS, and that is exactly what we've done. So reducing the waiting list backlogs built up during the pandemic and improving a &E performance remain absolute priorities for the health portfolio budget. The increased funding for NHS Scotland will, will support our cross-system approach to performance, productivity and improvement grounded in, of course, important clinical leadership across NHS Scotland. I call Brian Whittle to be followed by Emma Harper. Hey, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, what the Cabinet Secretary's statement today proves is that we should never underestimate the SNP Government's willingness to prioritise the short-term gain, regardless of the potential for long-term pain. This lack of ability to develop a long-term strategy is coming home to roost, and the Scottish public are paying a heavy price with the continued closures of community facilities and lack of investment in local public services. So, by doubling down on this short-term sticking plaster economic strategy, does the Cabinet Sec Secretary accept that she is condemning Scotland's public services to a state of perpetual crisis management? Cabinet Secretary. I mean, it really takes a brass neck for Brian Whittle to come here and talk about short-term yeah. gain when we've seen tax cuts as a pre-election bribe to the electorate. What's a short-term gain other than that? And to talk about no money for public services, the consequentials we got didn't have any money for public services other than £10.8 million for the NHS. And had we followed the advice of Brian Whittle's own front bench, we would have put all of that money into business tax cuts and none into public services, yeah, yeah. whether it's the NHS or local government. So I can't understand how Brian Whittle thinks it's OK to come here and ask for more money for public services when his own government have butchered yeah. public services and have prioritised tax cuts. It really is a bit of a brass neck. I call Emma Harper to be followed by Colin Scott. The Finance Secretary will be aware of the unique challenges of rurality and depopulation facing Dumfries and Galloway and the Scottish borders. Can she further outline how this budget will support people in d and in the borders most, impo most impacted by the Tory-created cost-of-living crisis and to help address depopulation to attract people to the region by improving transport and infrastructure? Cabinet Secretary. Can I say to uh, Emma Harper that we will uh, shortly publish our Addressing Depopulation Action Plan uh, early next year. This contains a range of commitments that will support communities to deliver uh, place-based interventions, supporting population attraction and retention. Making Scotland an, an attractive and welcoming country is a key pillar of our population strategy. And to help deliver this ambition, we'll launch a talent attraction and migration service in 2024 that will support employers to use the immigration system effectively to address their skills that they need. It will help people to move to Scotland and successfully settle into their communities, including the south of Scotland. And of course, as we know from the figures from NRS, we still have net in-migration to Scotland from the rest of the UK. And that's very welcome. I call Colin Smith to be followed by Colette Stevenson. Thank you, President Officer. Given that the National Minimum Wage will be £11.44 per hour from April, does the Cabinet Secretary really think paying social care workers just an extra 56p will make any difference to the social care recruitment crisis? And given that she was the Health Secretary who promised to eradicate delayed discharge, but is now presiding over it at record levels, how many hundreds of millions of pounds has she had to build into her budget to pay for the cost of this incompetent government utter failure to tackle delayed discharge? Yeah. Secretary. Well, of course, uh, through the additional support to those social care workers, that will mean £2,000 a year extra. But that's £2,000 a year extra we wouldn't be able to afford if we didn't have the tax position that we've had, which your front bench didn't want to raise those additional tax revenues. So you want more money for social care workers, but you don't want to raise Cabinet the Secretary, revenues please to please pay seat for it. For a second. I, I really must insist that when a question is asked, we must listen to the response, please. Cabinet Secretary, please resume. Yeah, I, I think the incoherence on the Labour front bench yeah. and the back bench is really something that they should have a word with. 
I call Colette Stevenson to be followed by Donald Cameron. Colette Stevenson. As the Deputy First Minister outlined, the UK Government's autumn statement was the worst case scenario with big consequences for the Scottish Government's budget. In the face of continued Westminster austerity and the Tory made cost of living crisis, can she outline what the Scottish Government is doing and the challenges it faces in terms of trying to mitigate so many reckless Tory policies? And can the Deputy First Minister also highlight the measures in this budget? that will help to tackle inequality. Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I uh, say to Colette Stevenson that uh, as a government we have spent over a billion pounds mitigating the impacts of 13 years of UK government policies such as the bedroom tax and the benefit cap. The UK government's autumn statement, as I've said, was a missed opportunity to reverse uh, these policies and wider spending decisions that have resulted in our, um, a 1.2 per cent real terms reduction uh, since the 2022-23 budget was uh, presented uh, from the UK government. By contrast, this government continues to prioritise investment to tackle and reduce poverty, including committing £6.3 billion in social security benefits and payments just over a billion pounds more than in 2023-24. This is our single biggest increase in funding in this budget, helping uh, to deliver our national mission to tackle inequality. I call Donald Cameron to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you. In last year's budget, the government eventually pledged £6.6 .6 million to Creative Scotland. It then cut that funding entirely in September, before being forced to reinstate it and shattering the confidence of those who work in culture and the arts, you turning not once, not twice, but three times. We now have a supposed commitment to Creative Scotland for next year, but how do we know we can trust this government to deliver for the culture sector when it has been so cavalier with its promises in the past? Cabinet Secretary. Well, what we do know is that we can't trust the UK government because they put no money into culture. Yeah, exactly. They cut culture None. budgets. You so you're coming here asking for more spending on an area that your own government reduced funding to. I don't quite understand how you think that's actually a thing. So let me be really clear, as I said in my statement, that we'll increase funding to the culture sector by £15.8 million. That's the first step on the path to increasing funding for the culture sector by 100 million in five years and will provide Creative Scotland with the 6.6 .6 million in national lottery shortfall funding for 23-24 along with a further 6.6 .6 million for 24-25. But we wouldn't have been able to do any of that have we followed the advice of the front bench to put every penny into business tax cuts, not public services. So again, I think you ought to have a word to get a bit of joined up thinking going on here. I call Fulton McGregor to be followed by Ariane Burgess. Hey, thank you, President Officer. Given its role in supporting young people in our communities with a whole range of issues, from improving mental health and wellbeing to reducing antisocial behaviour, can I ask the Finance Secretary what consideration is given to youth work in our budget deliberations? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I know the importance of uh, youth work, having uh, been a community youth worker back in the day uh, before I came uh, into Parliament. And of course, it is an important service that is delivered uh, by local government, and therefore the 14, over £14 billion that we're given a record level of funding to local government, I hope will help to sustain services like youth work, which are so important in making sure that we support young people, particularly vulnerable young people. I call Ariane Burgess to be followed by Kevin Stewart. Green MSPs have pressed to ensure this budget invests in the green economy of the future, and I welcome that these proposals will see £4.7 billion invested in cutting carbon emissions and tackling the nature emergency. And this is the right thing to do for the people and for the planet of Scotland, of the people of Scotland. And this is the right thing to do for the planet and for the people of Scotland too. Already households are feeling the benefit at this week's report from the Fraser Valander Institute highlighted with a huge growth in jobs in the renewable sector. It's critical though that these benefits are felt in rural communities. So can the Deputy First Minister set out how the budget will support green job creation in rural Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, 
Woodland creation, sustainable management of Scotland's national forests and lands and peatland restoration are part of our just transition to net zero. The £129 million funding for these uh, supports Scotland's rural economy, uh, create economic opportunities and, of course, uh, good green jobs. Uh, green job creation and support for workers and young people transitioning uh, into those roles remains at the heart of the Scottish Government uh, planning and we welcome the Fraser of Allender Institute study which shows, as I said in my statement, that the renewable energy sector supported more than 42,000 jobs across the Scottish economy and generated over £10.1 billion of output in 2021. I call Kevin Stewart to be followed by Jamie Hawker Johnson. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary, in her statement, uh, talked of the fact that this was a one year budget. Does the um, Deputy First Minister agree with me that long term strategic budgeting, uh, such as is done by most of our uh, European neighbours, uh, would be much better uh, for all concerned? Uh, and that the one-year budgeting uh, that is currently uh, put before us by the Treasury uh, is uh, short-term pain and long-term pain, uh, but that is what we have come to expect uh, from ba bankrupt, broken Brexit Britain. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I would agree with that, and that's one of the reasons that I'll come back at the medium-term financial strategy point in May to set out what we think will be the fiscal position going forward when we have more certainty, because this autumn statement is an extraordinary autumn statement that is clearly a pre-election bribe to, tax, uh, to cut taxes at the expense of public services. That makes it very difficult to plan on a multi-year basis. So we will set out further plans uh, in uh, May when we get to that point, once we have more certainty of the fiscal position going forward. Jamie Halker Johnson to be followed thank by Jim Fury. Thank you. Can I remind the Chamber of my register of interest as a partner in a farming business and as a member of NFUS, SLE and the Royal Highland Agricultural Society. Presiding officer, tens of millions of pounds will be stripped away from the agriculture budget in the next financial year, with £61 million pounds, um, of ring fence funding already cut in year. This budget is an attack on rural Scotland. So what does the Cabinet Secretary have to say to Scotland's farmers and crofters who will feel angry and abandoned by this SNP Green government in Edinburgh. Cabinet Secretary. Well, we got no money for rural Scotland or agriculture from the UK government. So again, Jamie Halcrow Johnson comes here, comes here, comes here and contradicts his front bench who wanted all of the money spent on business tax cuts and he wants it spent on agriculture. I set out in my statement the importance of agriculture and supporting the rural economy. I have made clear, as I did to NFUS, that we will return that £61 million with a start this year and we will work with them in terms of the priorities going forward of when that funding will be returned. But it is a bit rich for any Tory member to come here and talk about the lack of money for rural Scotland or agriculture when not a single penny has been given by his UK government colleagues for that purpose. And again, not a penny was asked for by the Tory front bench. Again, just total incoherence. I call Jim Fairley to be followed by Ash Reagan. Thank you very much, President Officer. Can you hear um, me? Mr Fairley, Mr. Fairley me? please Can you? resume your seat for a wee second. We need to hear the person who has the floor, and the person who has the floor is not any one of the people who are sitting on these benches here. The person who has the floor now is Mr Fairley. Thank you. Thank you, President Officer. Cabinet Secretary, in light of the almost 10% reduction in the Scottish Government's budget, uh, in terms of capital funding. Can you tell my constituents what this will mean for the timescale of building the new elective treatment centre at Perth Royal Infirmary? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Jim Fairley is, is right to point out the impact of a 10% cut in capital budgets over the next five years that will have a profound effect on our ability to invest in our infrastructure. So when we will come back in the new year with our revised infrastructure investment plan that will set out 
what we are able to do and the time frames that we will be able to do it. But if anyone in this chamber thinks a 10% cut to our capital budget will not have an impact on our infrastructure investment, then they are living on another planet. So we will set out our priorities and how we will make sure that we continue to invest in Scotland's vital infrastructure. I call Ash Regan to be followed by Bob Doris. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The budget shortfall is down to the Conservatives choosing, choosing to keep children in poverty and underfund the NHS across the UK. And these are very clearly political choices, not economic ones. So this funding model is not working for Scotland and securing independence is the only way out of this mess. But I note in the 30-minute speech of the Deputy First Minister no mention of funding to advance the cause of Scottish independence. If spending reflects priorities, this government is not serious about independence, is it? Cabinet Secretary. Well, let, let me find a, a point of agreement, uh, first of all, with Ash Regan, as I always try to do, and that is that she's right about the political choices that this uh, UK Tory government has made a political choice to cut NHS funding in real terms by 0.8%. Had we followed that political choice, then all the health boards in the Tory members' areas would have seen cuts to their funding and they would have had to have been explaining to nurses and doctors and their constituents why that was, why were we following Tory spending plans and cutting the NHS. But of course, we won't do that because those are not our priorities. Our priority is, of course, uh, protecting frontline NHS funding. In terms of the other business of government, as uh, Ash Reagan will know, uh, we have Jamie Hepburn uh, working on the matters uh, that she, respond, she alluded to. And of course, it is important. Of course, it is important because, as I set out in my statement, to get away from Tory austerity budgets for good requires us, presiding officer, to have independence. I call Bob Doris to be followed by Martin Whitfield. Uh, presiding officer, there are understandably concerns from disabled people that unprecedented pressures on public finances may impact on support given to them. Concerns only exacerbated by UK government plans to slash sickness benefit, force disabled people into work and to act as Minister for Disabled People. What reassurances can the Deputy First Minister give to disabled people in Scotland that the Scottish Government will take a different approach here and that this budget will support the needs of disabled people here in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Oh, can I say to Bob Doris that he's absolutely right about the butchering of uh, welfare uh, support by the UK government. They see it as the go-to area to uh, cut support to those who are most vulnerable. And I'm sure we've not seen the last of that from this UK uh, Tory government. In stark contrast, as I set out in my statement, we are going to uh, support the, the re-establishment of the Independent Living Fund to make sure that we can support those uh, who are living independently um, and to uh, make sure that more people who want to live independently in their own home will be able to do so through that Independent Living Fund. And of course, I should also say that one of the biggest investments here in this statement and in our budget is the investment in social security benefits more than £1 billion higher than the funding we receive through the Social Security block grant adjustments from the UK Government. The contrast could not be starker. I call Martin Whitfield to be followed by Stephen Kerr. Very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. On page 71 of the unredacted booklet, the Children's Rights Protection and Justice Bill goes up to £53.6 million next year and then falls to 51.4. Could the Deputy First Minister confirm that ongoing support from the Government for the UNCRC implementation programme will last three years and go beyond the first quarter of next year? Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, yes, I can. But of course, as I said earlier, in terms of multi-year uh, funding, we will come back to that in May of next year because of the difficulties of the autumn statement and the uncertainty of our fiscal position. We have, unfortunately, only by and large been able to set out one-year spending plans. But of course, Martin Whitfield will know that that is a key priority for us and we will make sure that the resources are there to fully take it forward. I call Stephen Kerr to be followed by Beatrice Wishart. Well, we have cuts to the Scottish Funding Council, the skills budget, student support and tuition fees. We've got cuts across the board in all the things that matter most to the future economy of this country. So let me ask the Deputy First Minister about Barnet Consequentials. Across the UK, the apprenticeship levy raises £3.5 billion annually. That would mean in Barnet Consequentials that the Scottish Government is receiving at least £300 million for apprenticeships. How much does the Scottish Government plan to spend directly on apprenticeships this year? And if it's not £300 million, as business would expect it to be, how much is it? Cabinet Secretary. Well, what I can say to Stephen Kerr is that £320 million consequentials for 24-25, there was nothing for apprenticeships within that whatsoever. Nothing. £260 million for business tax cuts, a small amount for Social Security and £10.8 million pounds for the tax? NHS. There was no funding for apprenticeships or skills or education or colleges. So if Stephen Kerr thinks that is where the UK Government should prioritise its funding, then he should have a word with UK Government Tory ministers who clearly don't think investment in public services, apprenticeships, skills or anything else is important. I call Beatrice Wisher, who's joining us online, to be followed by Graeme Simpson. Ms Wisher. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Deputy First Minister talks of support for a growing sustainable economy, but today it's been revealed that the Scottish Government is increasing the cost of lifeline travel on North Link ferries with an eye-watering fares hike of nearly 9%. What comfort is there in this budget for families and communities in the Northern Isles faced with additional travel pressures which will impact businesses as well as individuals already struggling through the cost of living crisis? Cabinet Secretary. Well, what I can say to Beatrice Wishart, of course, is that the ferry fares had been frozen uh, for four years uh, prior to this budget. But I will make sure the Transport Minister engages with Beatrice Wishart. It is absolutely no doubt that difficult decisions are having to be made because the money is simply not there to make sure that we can fund every part of the Scottish budget to the extent that we would want to. So we've had to prioritise frontline public services like our NHS, like our council services, like our education system. Those are the priorities that we've had to take. If Bearship Wisher or anyone else wants to come to me with different priorities, then of course they can do so, but they'll have to tell me where the money has to come from. I call Graeme Simpson to be followed by Russell Finlay. Thank you. The Finance Secretary has managed to deliver a £29 million real terms cut to the Transport, Net Zero and Just Transition budget. What did she say will be the effect of that? Cabinet Secretary. So, so today we've had Tory members coming here asking for more money for skills, for education, for housing, homelessness, transport and now net zero. However, uh, what I can say to Graeme Simpson is he may not have realised but the UK Government's biggest cut is to the environment and net zero budget within their own Budgets. That means that having a cut to net zero budgets by the UK Government of Westminster budgets has a direct result in the money available to this Government. So I think he should look to his own UK Government ministers for the decisions that they have made. And if you don't like them cutting net zero budgets, then you should have make representation to make sure that they change their position on that. This government will continue to invest in net zero. As I have set out, investing in net zero and our transport system in stark contrast to his UK government colleagues. And I call Russell Fidley. Thank you. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary says that Scotland's fire service will receive an extra £10.1 million for capital spending. But SNP ministers have starved the fire service of funding year after year after year. It would cost £800 million to fix the crumbling and dangerous estate. 
So does the Cabinet Secretary accept that firefighters will not be duped by her budget? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I know that our firefighters won't be duped by a UK Tory government that has slashed the justice budget at Westminster. One of the biggest cuts, one of the biggest cuts after net zero, I think it was, was to the justice budget yep. at Westminster. And yet we have Russell Finlay coming here demanding more money be spent on justice services. So we'll make sure we continue to protect our Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. We are increasing the money to the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. No thanks to any of the decisions made by his UK government Tory colleagues. And I could squeeze in Mr Lumsden if it's a very brief question. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I note that the rail budget has been cut by near £80 million in cash terms. So can the Cabinet Secretary explain how a cut to the rail budget will encourage more people onto our railways? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we will invest £1.6 billion to operate, maintain and improve Scotland's railway. We're investing £147 million in a prioritised programme for Scotland's railway that includes major project enhancements such as uh, East Kilbride improvements and the Leavenmouth Rail Link alongside development work for further electrification. And we'll invest £488 million on maintenance, safe operation and renewal of the Scottish Rail Network. But I say again to Douglas Lumsden, with a 10% cut to our capital budget over five years because the UK Tory government is cutting capital budgets. How does that help Scotland's railways? And if you don't think it does, then you should have a word with your UK Tory That's government right. colleagues. Because what we see here is incoherence with Tory members coming here asking for spend on just about all areas of the Scottish budget when not a single penny came for any single one of them from their UK Tory masters. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the statement and there will be a short pause before we move on to the next line of business.